on the present day team, you know, they're at the top of the league in defense. That was your calling card, your forte. They don't really have guys that would be known as, as lockdown defenders, but as a team, they certainly defend well. What do you feel like are some of those key elements to, to playing team defense that make that's making them successful this season? Well, the rules change in the NBA over the last couple of years, so it's a little bit easier to hide your uh, inability to guard individually. And you see that more and more often. That's why people was arguing with Draymond saying you're not one of the best defenders ever, just because the rules change. When we played, you had to be locked down individually. Um, now with the Knicks, they're big and strong. They're not seven footers, but they're all they're, they're tall and big and strong for this day and age in, the, in today's NBA. So with that being said, if you're athletic and you just follow the coach's instructions, you can literally be a lockdown team in defense. And if you push the ball like the Knicks do, you know, you're, the best offense is the best defense too, vice versa. So the Knicks is just primed to be a really good team. I, I'm really happy with what they're doing. You heard it here first. <laughs> From your lips to God's ears, hopefully the basketball gods heard that because yeah. I need a win and I need it bad. I need a <laughs> Fact. A little, I, I agree with you. We all need it. <laughs> hey, so let's let's talk uh, Julius. Let's get into yeah, Julius. Yeah, so listen, you're no stranger to Julius Randle. You have a little bit of history with him going back in 2016. He got a new hairdo. It's the Travis Scott meets the Emmanuel quickly, if you will. But hair aside, what is the biggest difference you've noticed in him from when you played with him to what you're seeing now, the all-star version of Julius Randle? Julius is my, my brother. I ain't going to call him my little brother because he a man now with a baby and a wife. So he, he's my brother. And I remember when I first got with him with the Lakers, um, I remember him just moving too fast. <laughs> and I remember him being, we played one-on-one -on -one like multiple times when I was towards the end of my career. And it was mostly like teaching sessions. I love Julius. And I, I think um, we, had, we had sessions at night too. Sometimes we'd just get to the gym at night and just work. And my thing was, um, I actually learned a lot from Stephen Curry and Klay Thompson towards the end of my career. And then when I was about 32, I learned some things from Pal Gasol. But before that, I learned some things from Larry Bird and Chuck Person. So when I started to train people, given just, it's not my stuff, it's just things I've learned and picked up. So one of the things with Julius was attack space um, and train like you play, play like you train, you know? be patient, use your footwork. And I see him doing some stuff now. It just makes me so happy. And I see him in his <laughs> seven threes. I'm just like, this is insane. And he's an all-star. It's just like, I'm just so happy for him. It was interesting happy. because Julius, you know, the version that Nick Scott last season is complete night and day from yes. the version that they have now. And he said in his Players' Tribune article that he wrote, that he took it personal that he wasn't the Randall that the Knicks fans, the franchise was hoping for. And he was just happy to have the second opportunity to reintroduce himself, to give them a new first impression. Has that character always been part of Julius Randall just striving constantly to being the best and then taking it personal when he isn't? Yeah, I think Julius was, what, what number pick was he? Like top five, right? I believe he was seven. He was either four or seven. seven or eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. really high pick. So a lot of pressure sometimes. And sometimes you got to get coming to your own. So when Julius was dominated in high school, it wasn't uh, demanded of him, you know, to be fundamentally sound. Right. So when he gets into the NBA, it's different. Um, you got to actually win and understand how to manipulate five other people, five defenders and four offensive plays and how to win, right? So... That just takes time. And even when he first got to the Knicks, he was still in the transition. Mm -hmm. He was still in transition from uh, being a better player. He wasn't there yet. He's still not there yet. He got so much upside. Oh, so we're only beginning to see. Listen, I am the captain of the Julius Randle Express. I have been since day one at CP. I have been Julius Randle's biggest advocate. So are you saying that we're only beginning to see signs of life of Julius Randle, that there's more to come? Oh, there's so much more to come because I'm now excited. That, I mean, but you gotta think about it. Like he's he's already physically ready. He's been physically ready. Uh uh mentally, um, from a standpoint of understanding how to win, that's just catching up. So now you're gonna see a it's gonna be a lot of things that happen. You're gonna see a better Julius, uh, a, a winning Julius, and then you're gonna see other players wanting to come to New York. 
to play with Julius. Right. And he's a pass guy. He passes the ball. Now he can shoot. I mean, why would you not want to play with Julius Randle, you know? So the fans want me to ask. We have to ask. If we're going to talk Julius Randle, we also have to talk R.J. Barrett. I am also a big R.J. fan. I call him the nine <laughs> five. Are you at all surprised at, I think one of the things that I love so much about RJ, he has this ability to get out of his own way mentally. We saw it in the game in the overtime win that we just came off of. You know, he did not have a good first half. He was just not the RJ that we're used to seeing. He didn't score until the last few seconds of the second quarter before halftime. And then he just turned on the Jets in the second half and then in overtime. Is that an impressive character trait to have in such a young player? He's only 20 years old to just not focus on what's going on in the game in totality, but just focus on how you can get better each and every play during that game. Yeah, I mean, RJ was a superstar in college and high pick and uh, and learning the game. He's, he had some really good games. I think RJ, he's like the opposite of Julius, right? He's not as physical as Julius when Julius came in. But in terms of the pace, his pace is amazing. He got a veteran pace. So with that type of pace, sometimes he, he, he might have to speed it up a notch or he just might have to get more comfortable. Um, Cause you know, he has good games and he has some games that's not great games, right? But his mental, his mental focus is there. He's reliable. And you know, that's why the Knicks is playing well because you have a guy who the Knicks are for the most part, almost building a franchise around and he's reliable mentally. So even if he's having a bad game, you know, physically or how it looks from the outside in, it might be a great game for him because maybe he did a grill. Maybe he did. Maybe he um, screened every single time perfectly. Yeah. Maybe he boxed out. Maybe he passed to the open man. It's those type of things that, you know, you don't, it doesn't really show up, you know, in a box score. So you can't really measure, you know, the effect that he's having. And then also being a cheerleader, you know, encouraging your teammates, like so many things add up. You know, when you're especially at that level. Yeah. And that's what Tibbs just said. He said, you know, even when he has bad games, he still impacts the game in, in a, v- a variety of ways, whether that's passing, rebounding, you know, being a good cheerleader, being a leader at 20 years old. And and you said something very important, and that's the mental toughness. And that's what I see from RJ, even at a young 20 years old, and Julius in year two. Because, like we said, as you said, patience, right? The fans ran out of patience with Julius even last year, his first year with the team, because he struggled a lot on the Fizdale. But I felt like that kind of made him stronger, toughened him up. And this year, he's, he's having an all-star season. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all-star season, you know. And uh, I think, you know, um, Fisdale, I'm not sure the ins and outs of that. Yeah. Obviously, they have a different coach now. And, and you know what? Julius is a, a better this year. But um, So, you know, Fisdale, I think he tried hard. I, I don't know his style. Um, I, I definitely wish I was head coach in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know coaching is your passion as well. We're going to talk about X versus X in a bit. Uh, from a coaching standpoint, you know, they, they're in the final stretch. They're trying to grind it out. They've lost a couple of tough games, bounced back and won uh, with RJ Soroks against the Grizzlies in overtime. From a coaching standpoint, what would you, how would you get them through this tough stretch as they push for the playoffs? You know, I think, you know, not, it's what, 30 teams in the NBA. Not everybody's the best. It's just, that's, it's just that simple. So sometimes, you know, as a fan, people are like, man, you're losing or you lost, but mm. you're, not, uh, you're not the Nets. You're not the Lakers. You are who you are. So it is what it is. And at this point, I would just advise them to have a great time, play the best you can play, and that is it. Do not worry about anything else because – if you're not one of the best teams, the numbers don't lie, man. You know, the numbers don't, the, the numbers say you are who you are. So with that being said, enjoy it. Do as best as you can in your slot. And you know, and if destiny says you, you're gonna win a title, do it. If destiny says you're gonna lose in the second round, it, it is what it is. Do your best and have a great time. And you spoke about patience, which is something Knicks fans do not have a lot of, and you can understand why, but there's this, you know, disconnect. Some fans want the Knicks to tank and try to get the best picks possible and worry about next season. And other Knicks fans like myself say, listen, we don't tank in New York. That's not part of our pedigree, but we do we go out there and play. Do you think that it's better, even if it's a low seed and you, you know, you get 
you know, wiped out the first round of the playoffs. Do you think that experience, especially for a team with so many young players on it, is priceless and it just makes you hungrier to want to do better the following seasons? Or do you feel like, you know, you can't try to get into the playoffs and, and jump the gun, especially when you're not fully ready? What is the better path to go? No tanking. You don't need to tank. You know, um, now I'm not in the front office, but I, I'm just saying build, <laughs> win. And I mean, this is New York City. So, you know, you can tank and then you're going to have a rookie who don't know what they're doing. And then you're going to have to tank again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you're going to be tanking all the time for the next five years. And then, then while the other team is building chemistry, you're trying to get players to come play on your team. But guess what? You're in New York City and New York is a lot of pressure. So you have to, you know, encourage veterans to come into a situation that they say, oh, wow, I know New York, I know it's a lot of pressure in New York, but that's a really good team. I'm, I'm going to New York. Yeah. Right. And the New York, New York, the Knicks, they can pay anybody. So there's no, there's no real need to tank for, for, to be, for, for being, uh, no, 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 no real need to, uh, for the Knicks to tank. And you speak about veterans and we have a vet in Derrick Rose and also in Taj Gibson on the mm -hmm. court. Can you just speak about what that means, especially as a young player, having that presence of somebody who's been there before, who knows the ins and outs of the league? How priceless is that for a team that's trying to build and create a culture like the Knicks are? Um, I think it's, I think it's great. And Derrick Rose is the ultimate. I'm so proud of him after his injuries. Um, and he's right where he should be. He's an amazing player. And then when Taj, Taj has been a really amazing um, role model and, and a great player. He's a really great player and an amazing role model. And when you have that type of cast, you want to build on that. You want to, you know, you want Taj and Derek to feel like they might have a shot to get to the playoffs. And then you want the young guys seeing, you know, when you smell blood, how you go after it, right? You don't want the young guys seeing a veteran, okay, we're tanking, and then the veteran just getting ready for vacation. Because then <laughs> it's going to be in their mind to just get ready for vacation in April. This is always where we get ready for vacation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I played, even if I didn't make the playoffs, I went, I practiced until it's game seven or the last game in the finals. Uh, that's when I took my vacation after everybody else. And it's just trying to develop a, and I only got one ring, all that for one ring. That's not even, I don't even have two rings. Hey, one still something. Yeah, you, you, you put in the work, man. You definitely <laughs> put in the work.